welcome to our meeting today. I'm here in my favorite lecture room, the first time in four months, H1. Uh, and uh, knowing by now and experiencing teaching via Zoom, I know that one doesn't want to talk too long. So I will uh, stick to 30 minutes at the most, I hope. Um, now, the corona crisis is, of course, mainly a health crisis. But it is also, and in the long run, perhaps even more importantly, an economic crisis. You know, when I talked to my friends and relatives via the phone at the beginning of the crisis, and I noticed a difference. Uh, people of my generation, older people, civil servants, they were mainly concerned about their health. But younger people, especially those uh, in business, were mainly concerned about the economic consequences. So what will these economic consequences be? Of course, it's very difficult in this time of uncertainty to make any clear predictions. What is clear is that the consequences are going to be very, very serious. Uh, about a fortnight ago, the OECD uh, made an economic forecast where they had two scenarios, uh, a single hit scenario and a second wave scenario, so to speak, to a worse scenario this year. And their predictions were that uh, world output would decline between 6 and 7.6%. Well, that's quite huge. Uh, in some countries, of course, it's worse. For example, Italy and France would see declines between 11% and 14%. In Austria, it could be more modest, something between 5 and 10%. But in any case, uh, this means that we get a very, very serious economic crisis, worse than the financial crisis 10 years ago, and probably the worst crisis economic downturn we are facing for 100 years. And the British, who have better historical statistics, say that it may be the worst crisis in 300 years. So uh, we also don't know how the crisis is going to develop over time. Usually people uh, fix some letter to it. So the optimists say it's going to be V-shaped. Yeah. Steep decline followed immediately by a steep rise. Uh, others think it's more going to be like U-shaped, where the recession lasts a bit longer before we get an uptake again. And pessimists think that it's going to be L-shaped, so it will remain lower uh, 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 for, for, for a long time. So in any case, it's clearly a very serious and big crisis. Now, uh, what I want to do is just make or highlight five aspects that I think are important and that I've written there on the blackboard in my back. I want to talk about supply and demand, as economists should, about contagion, about uncertainty, about market failure, and about long-run effects. So let's start, as all economists do, with supply and demand. Now, one of the main characteristics of this crisis is that it is both a supply and a demand crisis. Uh, crises in the past have very often been either supply or demand crisis, like the oil shock was mainly a supply crisis. Uh, uh, the financial crisis was mainly a demand crisis. Uh, this is a supply and demand crisis. Now, why is that? Well, the supply side is pretty obvious. Firstly, if you shut down firms, like shops and so on, uh, then of course, supply is decreased. Uh, secondly, and most importantly, we have a massive reduction in labor force. Right? If, you, if you think that uh, uh, people are sick and cannot work, or people are in quarantine uh, and cannot work, or people have to care for their sick relatives and can't work, or they have to look after their children who are not in school. Uh, so all that reduces the active labor force massively. Uh, of course, in this crisis, this is a little bit reduced 
uh, by the possibility uh, of distant working, remote working. You know, people, some jobs can be done from home via the internet, like this lecture or like my lecture, uh, but many things cannot be done in that way. So these are the direct supply effects. But they're also indirect supply effects, mainly uh, uh, due to the supply chains uh, that we have nowadays, where most goods are produced in different parts of the world and then assembled in another part of the world. Uh, and the rupture of these supply chains uh, uh, means that even firms who are not directly affected uh, by the crisis, by the illness, uh, may have difficulties getting their intermediate inputs. Uh, and that's particularly serious because the countries which have been very strongly hit, even the first wave, uh, namely China, Germany, United States, they are, so to speak, the hub of the international supply chains. Okay, so that's the supply side. That's pretty straightforward. But this crisis is not only a supply crisis, but also a demand crisis, a global demand crisis. Firstly, of course, uh, again, a direct effect. If you cannot go shopping, uh, then you cannot demand anything. Uh, but secondly, uh, of course, if you lose your job or if you can't sell your stuff and your income declines, uh, then you will demand fewer goods. So that's the classic multiplier effect. Uh, but finally, and perhaps most importantly, what we see, and I'll come back to that in my, second, in my third heading, uh, rising uncertainty, massively rising uncertainty, is usually very, very bad for consumption demand and for investment demand. Because these are demand components which can easily be postponed. And in times of uncertainty, people generally postpone these things. Okay, so we have a supply and demand crisis. This is what makes this crisis particularly severe. I move to my second point, contagion. Yeah, we know that contagion uh, in a health crisis is a, an important buzzword. And uh, in economics, we also see this global contagion uh, um, of the pandemic. Well, firstly, in, a, in, a, in, in at least three ways. Uh, the first way is pretty obvious, uh, movement of people. Uh, people are contagious. So uh, if people travel, uh, then they bring the disease around the world. Uh, if people move, if workers move for economic reasons, then they may spread the disease. Uh, so for example, many people think that the early outbreak of the disease in, in Italy is caused by the large numbers of Chinese workers who work in, uh, uh, in Italy. And uh, I think that the first cases in France and in Britain were British businessmen uh, who came from, an, from, a, from a trip from Asia. Uh, so the movement of labor and the movement of travelers, both economic activities, uh, spread the disease. So that's the most direct way of contagion. Now we've also seen already when I talked about supply that trade is contagious uh, uh, if we have very complicated supply chains. Uh, if, if one link in the supply chain is ruptured, uh, uh, then the whole supply chain uh, may be in difficulty. And then, of course, uh, there is the third link, which is uh, uh, financial institutions. Uh, in the financial crisis, we have seen that banks uh, and the financial market may transmit a crisis which starts in one country to the entire world. Uh, as a, a bankruptcy in one country harms banks in other countries and, 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 and closes down international money markets. Okay, so contagion is also an important component uh, 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 in this crisis. Now, perhaps the most important point is my third point, uncertainty. Now, we've seen a massive increase in uncertainty. Economists 
following Frank Knight and John Maynard Keynes, long before he wrote the general theory, uh, distinguish between risk and uncertainty. Risk is something where you can use a probability calculus. You don't know what the outcome is, but you know the probability of different outcomes. Uncertainty, on the other hand, is where you don't know these probabilities. So you cannot use a probability calculus. And Corona is a classic case of uncertainty. It's completely new. We don't know the probabilities, or we know them even less than we do it with other illnesses and diseases. So uh, we don't know we have uncertainty about the duration of the disease, how many waves there will be. Uh, we have uncertainty uh, about the spread, how fast it spreads. We have uncertainty about the severity of the cases. They differ in different countries so far. So there's an awful lot of uncertainty going on. Some people call it radical uncertainty. Um, there are known unknowns, like these things that I've just mentioned, you know, about the spread of the disease, etc. But there are also unknown unknowns, uh, things about which may be important, but we still don't know, and we uh, uh, don't know that we don't know. Uh, so this is a very basic increase in uncertainty. Now, what are some of the consequences of this uncertainty? Now, the first I've already mentioned, uh, it's very bad for consumption and investment. Now, recently we saw a part recovery of consumption uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, uh, but that may be uh, a kind of an, an early aberration and not a, a, a return to the new normal, so to speak. Secondly, in times of uncertainty, people's beliefs very often are biased uh, in, in, in a particular direction. Uh, people base their predictions very often on, on linear approximations. And if, for example, as many epidemiologists tell us, uh, uh, these illnesses develop in a kind of bell-shaped way, so they slowly rise and then they reach a peak and then they go down again, or as the British call it, the sombrero, then that means that when the slope is still very low, people extrapolate and they underestimate the disease. Whereas then when the uh, uh, disease cases are rising very steeply, people tend that this is going to continue and they overestimate diseases. So these switches from underestimation to overestimation uh, may lead uh, to very negative economic outcomes to switching from good equilibria to bad equilibria and causing crisis of their own. Um, a third point with regard to radical uncertainty uh, that I would like to, to, to mention is, which I find quite interesting, that we now see a, a return of the expert. Now, in recent years, people have denigrated the role of experts. They have said they are part of an elite, they can't be trusted. Brexit, for example, has been uh, a, a, an example of that. And therefore, uh, one should discount uh, their opinions. Now they are back, uh, even people uh, uh, like the British Prime Minister or the American President, uh, who, who, who didn't have too many experts at their side before, now hardly ever appear without having two experts uh, or one expert at their side. Uh, now that's of course good, primarily uh, impressive, but, uh, but it's also curious, because experts are particularly good when there's lots of experience and risk, but not uncertainty. Uh, if there's a lot of uncertainty, then very often the experts don't know that much more uh, uh, than, than people. Uh, and uh, what experts, the main experts in the field now, uh, epidemiologists who operate with models. Now we economists 
know all about models and about their problems. Uh, models are based on assumptions. And these assumptions in times of radical uncertainty are very uncertain. So for example, assumptions about the spread of the disease, about mortality, they are quite crucial to all these models. Uh, that means that one shouldn't rely too much on the forecasts of these models uh, if one is very unsure about the assumptions. So these models should probably not be used too much in making forecasts, but rather in highlighting what the important assumptions are and finding the information necessary uh, to, to form these assumptions in a uh, realistic way. Okay, so uncertainty. Uh, the fourth point is the, the big increase in government action in this crisis. Uh, so like in a war, uh, the pandemic has led to a massive increase in government action everywhere. Now why? Uh, uh, why can't we leave these things to the market? We know Economists know that free markets have lots of advantages. Uh, they give the right incentives to satisfy consumers' wishes. Uh, uh, they bundle the information, uh, as Hayek has shown in, in, in one number, the price. Uh, all the relevant scarcity information is there. Uh, so usually, market economists work quite well in a flexible environment. And they have proven that to a certain extent even now. Uh, I mean, in spite of this huge crisis, this unprecedented crisis, uh, the supply of goods has been relatively stable. I mean, food was, I mean, I was particularly careful. Uh, I have a big family and I live with my mother who is 90 and I'm myself in a risk group. So for the first two months, we basically didn't leave our house. But we got basically everything delivered uh, uh, by various shops. So there was never any serious scarcity. Okay, there was some problem with toilet paper at the beginning and flour, uh, but that very soon got solved. So for these kind of basic things, the market works quite well and uh, uh, we wouldn't want state control of toilet paper or things like that, because uh, the market does this much better. However, the crisis also showed that there are big, big classic market failures in a pandemic. And therefore, there's a very good reason why governments have interfered so massively. Uh, firstly, uh, there are externalities. No externalities are effects on bystanders, so not the economic supply and demand itself, but the uh, bystander. Now, there are negative and positive ones. The massive negative externality is, of course, for example, if you travel or if you're to Lombardy for holiday or if you go to a rotary meeting or if you take part in a demonstration or if you go to a corona party. Uh, then, of course, you risk your health, but you also risk other people's health, uh, even those who have not been at that meeting or who haven't joined you in this travel. Uh, so this is a negative externality which justifies restrictions that the government uh, has introduced. Restrictions on travel, restrictions on meeting, restaurants, things like that. Uh, so these are classic negative externalities. Uh, same true for travel and migration, yeah? so that you, that you stop uh, uh, traffic at the border, movements at the border, makes sense in a crisis in the short run. Uh, there are, of course, also positive externalities. Uh, for example, if you uh, find a vaccine, uh, that's in a way a global public good. So everybody benefits uh, from that. Or if you find the right strategy to contain the disease, yeah, different strategies that are possible, if one close schools or not, and so on and so forth. Yeah. If you find the right strategy, uh, then others can learn from that 
and you have created uh, a positive externality. Now these positive externalities should be subsidized by the state. So it makes a lot of sense for governments to use lots of resources to develop a vaccine, for example, or to develop the right strategy to contain this disease, not only for their, in their own interest, but in everybody's interest. So that's externalities. The second classic form of market failure is risk and insurance. Uh, we have uh, in international trade increased efficiency enormously by these huge supply chains. But they also mean, as we have seen, dependencies, uh, and especially in, in, in medication. Uh, if uh, for the supply of pharmaceutical products, we are completely dependent on one source, and that's very dangerous. Uh, so in Italy, for example, I've read that 70 to 80% of all blood thinners come from China. So that's, if there's a break in the link there, uh, that's a, a big problem. The same face masks and, and, and lots of other stuff. So uh, in these cases of uninsurable risk, uh, some self-sufficiency uh, may be useful and the market will not provide it. Um, another point is of course, if we have a demand, a sudden demand shock, uh, a Keynesian demand shock, then some stabilization policy, fiscal expansion, monetary expansion, uh, can be justified. And that's, of course, what is happening at the moment on a huge scale. Um, and finally, uh, not finally, but for my talk here, finally, uh, a pandemic hits different people differently. Some people even benefit from it. If you produce some, if you are the developer of Zoom, then you benefit a lot uh, 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 from the crisis. But most people are harmed and some are very seriously harmed, who have no harm, who have no, no fixed income, for example, and, and get unemployed, etc. So some redistribution of this burden uh, uh, is also call, call, called for, and that's not easy. It's not easy to find the victims uh, uh, who should be compensated, and it's even more difficult to find the winners who should be taxed. Or to find them is perhaps easier, but to tax them uh, is not, it's not so. So there are multiple market failures which justify the massive government intervention that we observe. Okay, and finally, long-run effects. Well, as I said, it's, it's very difficult to predict uh, uh, in, in these uncertain times. There will certainly be some positive effects. Maybe the next pandemic, we will be better prepared, or the next massive crisis, we will be better prepared. Maybe there will be a boost to innovation in, in certain technologies. Things will be speeded up. Uh, I mean, four months ago, I didn't even know that Zoom existed. And now I work with it every day. So uh, that, that can be a boost, like wars, that can be a boost. So there may be some positive consequences of this. But of course, the main consequences uh, are going to be negative. Um, I mentioned three. Um, well, the first is what we economists call hysteresis. You know, if someone is sick or if someone gets unemployed, uh, then even if he gets healthy again and if he gets employed again, uh, he may not be as productive as before. So a short-term shock may have long-run uh, uh, consequences on people's productivity. Secondly, the international division of labor, globalization. Globalization has brought innumerable advantages to many people. I mean, that we, that we can buy our technical equipment so cheaply now is clearly due uh, uh, to globalization. On the other hand, it brought these risks. And even the past 10 years, globalization has, has stalled. What, what the, it's not deglobalization, 
but it is what, uh, uh, what the economist called slowbalization. Yeah, so it's gone much slower. Uh, if you look, for example, at the statistic of our export goods, uh, the domestic share of them has increased uh, in the past 10 years. In, in China, it increased in the past 20 years, but globally, it has increased for the past 10 years. Um, so we will see probably a massive reduction uh, in, well, perhaps not massive, but a reduction in globalization. Uh, uh, what does that mean? We will have more trade barriers. Already we see, uh, even before the crisis, we saw the China-US conflict, uh, um, erection of, 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 of tariffs, which had been declining for decades, now are increasing again. So probably there will be uh, a, a reduction in trade. At the moment, uh, uh, trade is down by a third, uh, and, and, and this will have consequences on efficiency. The same is true for foreign direct investment. We have seen a, a massive fall in foreign direct investment after the pandemic. Countries are thinking of protecting their domestic industries from foreign takeovers uh, for very good reasons, uh, but in the long run, uh, this can mean that we have uh, uh, a decline in foreign direct investment uh, and a less dynamic economy. And of course, we may have another backlash, backlash against labor migration, uh, uh, which also increases, uh, I mean, labor migration increases efficiency. So a backlash against it will not be good uh, for the international uh, 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 economy. So these deglobalization effects will have negative efficiency and growth effects. Uh, that's pretty likely if they go too far, and that's likely. And uh, finally, uh, maybe the third and maybe the most important long-run effect is the role of the state again. Um, the 19th century has shown that in post-war periods, the role of the state has been much, much increased through the pre-war uh, compared to the pre-war situation. And that may happen with this pandemic too. Uh, so the role of the state in running businesses, for example, uh, uh, might be expanded as some people uh, 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 demand. Um, and of course, we will end up definitely with a huge government debt, almost everywhere in the world. And uh, I mean, Rogoff and Reinhardt in a famous article have said that certain debt levels, beyond certain de debt levels, we get a negative effect on growth. I mean, their precise numbers are probably wrong, uh, but the general idea that excessive debt is negative for growth, uh, that seems to be uh, a pretty stable. Uh, and of course, there's also the danger that this huge government debt uh, and the huge increase in the monetary base that we see central banks are pursuing uh, may lead to long-run inflation, you know, like in the 1970s. So these are the dangers. Uh, some chances, but these are the dangers. Uh, and I think uh, I'm about uh, uh, used up my time. Uh, so uh, I thank you for your uh, interest. And I look forward to your question around these five, qu uh, five topics or on anything else, really. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nolak, for your very interesting presentation. Now we are opening the question and answer part. Uh, if you want to raise questions, please post a comment on our Facebook site or send an email to conference at da-vienna.ac.at. One question has already come in, Professor Neudig, concerning the um, aspect of uncertainty, because there uh, exists a so-called so fear index or volatility index, uh, by which um, the uncertainty is traded in a certain way. And some hedge fund made a lot of money with this. Do you think also that this is a good tool to predict the development of the market, like some other economists do? 
Yes, I think uh, these indices are important. And I mean, there are many of them. Yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, Institute for Economic Research has uh, uh, does some of these indices for Austria and they have all mass massively increased, which is, which is not a su surprise. Yeah. And as I say, that's, that's the main reason why we are worrying about macroeconomic demand, because uh, whenever uh, uncertainty increases, demand usually slumps consumption and investment. That's why government expenditure has increased to compensate for that. And why we try to boost, well, why the government tries to boost uh, people's income uh, in order to, to, to increase their spending. Uh, is there not also the, uh, the danger by this tra uh, tradable risk that uh, there would be a stronger or increasing wealth transfer to the wealthier, already wealthier classes? Yeah. As I have, as I have uh, said before when I talked about market failure, um, the pandemic will have distributional consequences. It's not quite clear uh, whether it will increase uh, inequality or not, but it's very likely uh, uh, to increase inequality uh, uh, because people's jobs are uh, 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 at risk. And uh, share prices fell originally a lot, but they have recovered relatively quickly. Um, we don't know whether that remains uh, uh, so maybe it's also the result of the policies, the macroeconomic policies uh, uh, worldwide, but that would suggest uh, uh, that, uh, that we get more inequality uh, with a function of the government uh, to, um, to lessen this effect, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and concerning the question of partly deglobalization, uh, one listener asked if uh, could we afford this at all, a partly deglobalization, or could we not do it? Could we afford it? Well, that's the question. I mean, it will reduce efficiency. Uh, uh, I mean, in some cases, it makes perfect sense. Yeah? Uh, but at the moment, we are trying to produce everything as cheaply as possible and as affordable as, as possible. And of course, if we uh, uh, cut these uh, uh, chains or reduce them, uh, then that will normally lead to higher costs and that will reduce uh, people's well-being. So it will become less affordable to buy computers and other uh, technical stuff uh, uh, that, we, that we so desperately need. Um, can we afford it? Um, I think we will afford it uh, because the dangers of globalization in a, in a, in a pandemic uh, are much more obvious. You know, the dependency on China and all these things are much more obvious. So people are likely to have a political reaction against it. Whereas the advantages of these supply chains uh, and the low inventories, which I haven't mentioned, uh, uh, that of course are not so obvious. They mean that we pay uh, less money for our, for our gadgets, uh, but that is not directly linked uh, to, uh, um, uh, to globalization. So yes, uh, whenever you want more security, whenever you want uh, uh, um, shorter supply chains, uh, whenever you want higher inventories to have more flexibility and more resilience, uh, then that costs money. And uh, uh, whether we want or not, I guess we'll have to afford it. Uh, the next question would be, uh, if you could please give us your opinion about some economic aspects of the Corona crisis concerning the developed countries like in Africa or so. Well, um, we still have a, a hope uh, that uh, Corona may not be so dangerous in Africa uh, than somewhere else. Yeah, we, Professor Pondi, who is teaching uh, um, African studies here at the Diplomatic Academy, uh, uh, hoped uh, 
Uh, so far, the, the, the contagion there is not so strong. Uh, and therefore, maybe uh, they are, hopefully, they are less affected uh, than us. On the other hand, of course, they will be indirectly uh, uh, affected. The prices of raw materials uh, go down in a recession, of course. Uh, and if they are exporters of these goods, uh, that's bad for the terms of trade. Uh, of course, if countries uh, run into difficulties, if rich countries run into difficulties uh, uh, um, in, in, in a crisis, they are less likely to help poorer countries, development aid. Yeah, so when we talk about contagion, I haven't mentioned contagion by government action. Uh, for example, closing your border, uh, um, something called sick and die neighbor policies. Uh, uh, that, of course, will be bad for developing countries who depend on trade and on aid. And if both of these things uh, um, dry up, uh, then it's going to be tough for them, even if they are not hit as hard by the crisis um, as the rich countries. Now, that's, by the way, one aspect so far of this crisis, that it has hit mainly the rich countries first. Usually it's the other way around. Uh, the countries who have only a, a, a small share of global GDP are hit uh, uh, by these health crises, and not the countries who are, so to speak, the, the workhouse of the world. Uh, shifting now uh, to the European Union, uh, what do you think about the EU's measures? Are the frugals going to make the recession worse or would extra spending from southern countries, made possible by cheap money, cause the debt to reach unsustainable levels? I mean, for the European Union, I mean, there's the theory which says the European Union uh, grows with crises. Uh, uh, recent experience, I'm not so sure that that's the case. I mean, the weaknesses, I mean, there are chances and there are problems. You know? Uh, uh, the weaknesses of the, uh, say, of the Eurogroup, that you have a common monetary policy, but not a common fiscal policy, of course, becomes even more important now when some poorer countries in the South who have already been hit by other crises now are particularly hit by, uh, uh, by this crisis. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, I said uh, Italy uh, uh, will have other predictions uh, of 11 to 14 percent GDP decline, whereas Germany it's I think five to six to eight yeah? percent. So it's it's much less. Yeah? Um, so that is certainly uh, a, um, a problem. Yeah? It would mean even higher transfers from the rich north to the poor south, and the question is. Uh, whether, whether that's politically feasible on the one hand. On the other hand, if not now, then what are the circumstances when it could be feasible? Because this is clearly not the fault of the Italians uh, that they were hit uh, so hard by, by, by Corona, or at least not primarily uh, their fault. Um, and therefore, maybe, um, and there are strong hints in this uh, Merkel agreeing to these uh, recovery plans uh, that now the Germans are willing to uh, be more open to a transfer union. Um, I don't think that the Italian government debt are in, is in great immediate danger because the European Central Bank has made it quite clear that they're going to intervene uh, to uh, keep the money flowing, so to speak. So. Um, as long as the European Central Bank is doing that, uh, buying basically government bonds from the southern countries, uh, I don't think there's any danger of them uh, uh, um, going bankrupt or having to pay uh, very high interest rates. Concerning the current implementation of massive financing programs to cushion the crisis by the uh, countries of the European Union, uh, who will pay for this uh, in the nearby future and in which possible ways? Uh, 
Who will pay for all this? Well, we all will pay for it. Uh, uh, and it, of course, depends how it is going to be financed. Um, if it is financed by inflation, uh, which wars in the 19th century usually have done, uh, uh, then money holders and people who have nominally fixed incomes are going to be uh, 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 the, the ones who pay. If it is financed by taxes, uh, uh, then whoever <laughs> is the taxpayer uh, will pay. So the answer is we don't know. My hunch is that it will be money holders and probably uh, um, owners of property because now everybody is, is buying uh, property and if you are a property owner, it's difficult to escape. That's the nice thing also about inflation. And it's difficult to ex escape it if you have uh, money holdings. Uh, so uh, these, I think, would be uh, uh, people who should be uh, worried uh, uh, that they, they have to pay their share um, at some stage. But generally, everybody has to pay, of course. And how long do you think the economy needs to recover? Nobody knows. Uh, 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 some hope uh, that we will reach uh, in Europe, Austria, and Germany, we will reach GDP, uh, pre crisis GDP uh, in, in, in 22, uh, or 21. Uh, that's not unlikely. Of course, it depends how the uh, disease develops and how our response to it develops and whether we find a vaccine. All these things are completely unknown, so therefore uh, 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 we simply do not know. Um, but uh, let's say with the, uh, with the Spanish flu, there are some uh, um, studies done there about previous health crises, and, and, and even 20 years later, there were still effects in, in, in these studies. So we don't know, but uh, it's very likely that there will be long run effects. It's not necessary. So if you're an optimist and you believe in the V, uh, uh, then uh, the effects will be short lived. And if you don't have a second wave, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, then uh, we may be lucky. But I think that's very unlikely. So the there's going to be some serious, uh, uh, even longer run um, effect.